Our next speaker is Dr. Sarah Null. Sarah is a um, faculty member in the Department of Watershed Sciences here in the Quinney College of Natural Resources at USU. She's, um, she uh, is a water resources systems modeler and has worked in a lot of areas, including reoperation of water systems, um, climate change impacts on water resources, water quality management to improve habitat for aquatic species, and then dam removal. And she's sort of bringing some of this together, I think, today in her talk, which is on hydropower relicensing, the relationship of that with, to climate change and stream habitats in regulated rivers in the American West. Great, so today I'm gonna to be talking about climate change relicensing, um, or excuse me, climate change in, in hydropower relicensing, which is kind of the in intersection of climate change, hydropower operation, and also in-stream and riparian habitats. Um, and I wanna thank my co-authors on this. This project has been going on a long time. It's kind of the project that just won't end for whatever reason. And so I wanna thank my um, co-authors, especially Josh Fears, David Reinheimer, Sarah Yarnell, and Scott Laguerre, they're at UC Davis and UC Merced. So the big question that, that we asked with this is how might FERC hydropower relicense, relicensing consider climate change? Currently, it's not, climate change is not considered in hydropower relicensing. So that was the question that we got tasked with. Um, we did this, we're applying this to California um, and so in the abstract, I said in American West, I, and I really, I have so much to talk about that I kind of limited this to California today. So I'll go over a little bit about hydropower relicensing, California in general, and then we're doing a case study with a whole lot of coupled and systems modeling to look at climate change impacts, water regulation um, on ecosystems. And so one, one note that when I'm talking about restoring ecosystems, these are regulated rivers. And so it's not restoring in, in kind of the, the um, textbook use. It's really, it's really kind of how can we manage our rivers that are regulated to improve or maintain habitats. But it's not returning to some prehistorical state. So a little bit of background on California. This is clearly a map of California. And this is color coded by precipitation. So if you look at that darkest blue color, that's 20% of the land, but that area gets 50% of the precipitation. So that's the Sierra Nevada range right up in here, um, the north coast. And then I'll also be talking about the Central Valley, which is right in this region. So there's a, there's a spatial offset of where precipitation occurs in the state. There's also a temporal offset. And so the climate in California is highly variable, in fact, water year types there have no normal. They go straight from wet and above normal to below normal, dry, and critically dry. So you could get years like this right up in here. This was 2011. This was the last El Nino, which tend to be wet in California. This was a year ago, a dry creek. There also, also water is very, um, is distributed not evenly across the year. So winters are wet and summers are very dry. That matters because people, of course, want water in the summer. So this is a map of urban areas. People mostly live along the coast, mostly in the Bay Area, LA, of course, and then increasingly in the Central Valley. Similarly, agriculture uses water in the Central Valley. There's a whole lot of water. This is a map of consumptive water uses by agriculture and along the coast. And agriculture is really important in California. Um, about half of the nation's nuts, fruits, and vegetables are grown in California. So it's, agriculture is just really a huge part of the, um, of the economy. So what does that mean for water? That means that we, in California, water is managed very, very heavily. Almost every single river is dammed. There are two dams that are not dammed in, in, excuse me, two rivers that are not dammed in California. We move water generally from the north part of the state to the south and also from the east part to the west part. So very heavily managed water systems. This makes for very tough um, living conditions for riparian and in-stream in ecosystems. Also, when water is moved from, when it, it, when it drains naturally or it's moved from high elevations to low elevation places, we can of course create hydropower. Hydropower is about 20% of the energy portfolio in California, and the water energy nexus is very tight because of that. 
So non-federal non hydropower dams have to be relicensed every 30 to 50 years. That's, that's the, the scope that, that happens on. They're relicensed by FERC, the Federal Energy, Energy Regulatory Commission. Um, it's an, and one, one more thing I wanted to, to, to just mention here is relicensing it presents one of the few formal opportunities to change how rivers are managed and operated. It's so because these are regulated systems, this is one of the few formal opportunities to get more water, to get different timing, sometimes different quality of flows. So these relicensings re are very important for ecosystem management. However, not a lot of data goes into them. So on average, so like I said, the, the licenses last for 30 to 50 years. On average, they last for 38 years before the license is reopened for another relicensing. Um, the total monitoring on average about seven years is collected through the whole, of data is collected through the whole license period on ecosystems. Normally, right after a licensing, there's about three to five years of heavy data collection, and then about once every five years, ecological data is collected. And this is really important because 92% of, of relicensings change flow conditions. Fish monitoring is only included 67% of the time, and riparian monitoring is included far less than that. In fact, there wasn't, I couldn't even find statistics on it. Another kind of confounding factor is that when data is collected every five years, you can have a wet year or a dry year, so those are often hard to compare. They're, they're not really apples to apples or oranges to oranges. Um, so because of that, these decisions are made with, with not very much data. A little bit about climate change in, in California, some things that we do know. We know that climate change is changing California's hydrology. Air temperatures are expected to increase by about two to eight degrees Celsius by the end of the century. In California, there's supposed to be a slight dry, drying. So here in Utah, it's hard to say whether it will be drier and wetter. In California, we expect to be a little bit drier. What does that mean? That means snowfall will be shifting to rainfall in the mountain areas. This is a hydrograph. This is for the Tuolumne River. So this darkest blue is the historical hydrograph. You can see it's a snowmelt dominated hydrograph. So the peak of the runoff happened in, happens in June through July. The Tuolumne is a, is a nice high watershed. Then this is showing with two, four, and six degree climate warming just as a sensitivity analysis. So you can see by the time you get to four and six degrees warmer in the environment, the hydrograph really changes to a rainfall dominated hydrograph. So it's flashier. You can have in the same year more flooding and also more drought and extended drought conditions. So those are the things that we, we know, we feel very confident about for climate change in California. Okay, but as I've mentioned, currently hydropower relicensing doesn't consider climate change. Stakeholders in the Sierra Nevada um, region requested that climate change be considered in the new hydropower relicensings. However, FERC denied that request. So FERC is the federal agency. They denied that request. And they said, yes, we agree that climate change is happening, but there's so much uncertainty in the models that we don't think that we could get to um, very specific outcomes or impacts. So the California Angel the California Energy Commission, which is a state agency, funded us to say, okay, we want you to make one alternative that considers climate change. So the way that this is done is generally there's a number of alternatives um, for hydropower relicensing, and they go through all of them, and one is decided on. So basically, we're creating one alternative that includes climate change, and it looks also at hydropower generation, at ecosystems, in-stream and riparian ecosystems, water quality, all those sorts of things. Um, and, but it also includes climate change. It's not going to be chosen, of course, but the idea is to show that we can look at these things and, and to quantify the uncertainty with them. So the first thing we did is just to do a quick literature search of climate change terms in existing relicenses. So this is only for California, and we search for things like climate warming, climate change, global warming, and this was pretty interesting because we found that in stakeholder comments, about 31% of the time, stakeholders brought up climate change, but licensees only did 13% of the time. And then sometimes in the bibliography, we would find references to climate change. But so stakeholders are caring more about the climate change than licensees are. 
We did the similar thing for surrounding western states that have a whole lot of hydropower relicensings. So Alaska, Colorado, Oregon, and Washington, we did the same thing. And we found that outside California, um, licensees and stakeholders discuss climate change and relicense study plans even less. However, the same, same trend happened, that, that stakeholders were much more likely to be concerned about climate change than licensees. Only 2% of the time, licensees outside California mentioned climate change at all in the study plan. So then we've done a whole lot of both field monitoring and modeling to look at climate change impacts on hydropower, and then we're more interested in ecosystems. So I'm not gonna go too over too, this too much, and because this study has been going on a, a long time, some of the GCMs have changed and things like that, but basically, we take historical and downscaled climate, we run those through hydrology models, operation models, reservoir models, water quality models, sometimes ecosystem models. So there's a whole lot of coupled ecosystem hydroclimate modeling. The model scope of this project is quite large. It's on the, the meso scale. So we have 15 watersheds on the west slope of California's Sierra Nevada. So this is the region that we're modeling in California. It's a fairly large region, like I said, 15 entire watersheds. And then we have a whole lot of infrastructure in there. We have about 56 reservoirs. We have 85 um, fixed head hydropower plants, 16 variable, hydropower, variable head hydropower plants. We have a whole lot of diversions, often hydropower is diverted from the tailwaters. Um, we have 27 demand areas where water is used. And then most rivers in California, because they're regulated, have in-stream flow requirements. So we have all, so we have over 100 reaches with in-stream flow requirements. So the first thing we wanted to do, so now I'm getting into some modeled results. So the first thing we wanted to do is take these 15 watersheds and say, do, are they gonna respond the same way to climate change or might they respond differentially? And we found that they did in fact respond differentially. We used three metrics. We use, first of all, mean annual flow. So that's looking at basically water quantity with climate change. And this is with two, four, and six degree climate warming, just as a sensitivity analysis. So this is a pretty, pretty kind of basic analysis. Mean annual flow, and we said probably water supply is gonna care the most about water quantity. We looked at centroid timing, so that timing when the center of mass passes, basically the timing of runoff. And we said probably hydropower is gonna care the most about centroid timing. Um, because a lot, of, a lot of the hydropower plants are up in the mountains and they're fixed head plants. And then we looked at low flow du duration and we said probably ecosystems, specifically mountain meadows and riparian ecosystems, are gonna be the most susceptible to low flow durations. And what we found is all of these darker colors show more vulnerability to climate change. And these happened for a couple different reasons. I put some of the drivers in here. So um, water quantity was driven a lot by evapotranspiration. Timing was driven a lot by snowfall ch um, changing to, to rainfall, and that happened in the lower watersheds. And then low flow duration was, was primarily driven by soil properties. A lot of these basins are very granitic, so they don't hold so um, soil moisture very well. And then we wanted to look about, at water year types themselves. So water year types is comparing any given water year to the past. Mm -hmm. Um, which, which automatically is, is non-stationary, right? You're using historical averages. And saying compared to the, to the past, is this year wet, is it dry, is it about normal? So in California, they use five basic categories. This is for the Southern Sierra. There's two different ways of doing this for the Northern Sierra and the Southern Sierra. This top plot, plot, plot is the historical time period. So 1950 to 2000, 2001 to 2050, and then to 2099, so the end of the century. I know this is busy, so I'll take a minute and, and describe this. In, this. in this modeling effort, we used six different GCMs, so six different climate models, and two emission scenarios. Emission scenarios are used basically to represent human uncertainty to climate change. So I have eight, all the kind of warm hues are A2, which says we'll have severe climate change because we will continue to be a fossil fuel-based society. Um, we'll be, have more regional eco, um, excuse me, economies. B1 says we're gonna actually adapt so we'll have less severe climate change. We'll move away from fossil fuels. So in that you can see these two, the warm hues versus 
which are A2, the more severe versus the less severe, and all the different climate models. And I did that to really represent um, the uncertainty. What you see, the big takeaway, is we go from a uniform distribution of, of water year types to very heavily skewed to critically dry. So what does this mean for ecosystems? This is really actually very important for ecosystems where you have minimum in-stream flows. Those are decided upon by water year type and in, in dry and critically dry years, in the environment gets much, much less water. So you can see, oops. So you can see down here is a percentage. So environmental water uses are things like ripar for riparian rights. For fish, this is a delta smelt. And it goes from about 87% of the water down to 51. These are huge numbers, by the way, because environmental water, as it's categorized, includes uncontrolled flow. So it includes any water that we cannot manage is given to the environment in, the, in how we categorize it. Then we looked a lot at the snowmelt recession. This was work done by Sari Yarnell. Um, and she said, I think this snowmelt recession period is, is important for ecosystems, primarily riparian ecosystems. So the snowmelt recession is this period, generally in June, sometimes May or June, when you get this nice kind of smooth recession of flow. Um, that's when recruitment of willow and cottonwood and things like that happen. And she said, I think that there's basically abiotic stress in these, these really flashy flows in the winter. In the very low flows, there might be biotic stress. And then she looked at the magnitude changes, the rate of change, or that's the slope of the, the snowmelt recession, and the timing. And this is really interesting. I'm going to mostly, mostly focus on this graph. So this is showing here a snowmelt-dominated hydrograph. And this is timing of different, we have cottonwood recruitment, willow recruitment, mayfly emergence, um, steelhead spawning, out migration, and, and amphibian. And so here we have a snowmelt recession. Over here is a mixed rainfall and snowmelt driven hydrograph, a rainfall driven hydrograph, and then a regulated hydrograph, where normally there's low flows and we might negotiate to have a flood pulse. And what she found is that increasingly with climate change, Cottonwood recruitment, willow, willow recruitment will have a much harder time. Just the timing is, is not going to be right to have wet gravel bars and enough flow to be able to support cottonwood and willow recruitment. Similar thing, excuse me, with mayfly emergence and amphibians. Then we looked at actual hydropower generation. This was actually the most straightforward part, modeling Modeling effects on ecosystems is hard. Modeling climate change effects on hydropower generation is, is really quite simple. This is looking at seasons. So this is October, November, December, January through March, April through June, July through September. And this is 0, 2, 4, and 6 degree warming, again, as a sensitivity analysis. We found that with more rainfall, in the winter, we could, we could generate more hydropower. All the rest of the seasons, though, hydropower generation decreases. Overall, there was a 9% reduction in all the watersheds we looked at averaged in hydropower generation. So climate change, we expect to affect both ecosystems and hydropower generation. The flow effects on hydropower are important. They're important for ecosystems, both riparian and in-stream ecosystems. Um, this, is have, this has just a quick schematic of a dam with a river, a, um, a hydropower diversion with a hydropower plant. So this blue line is showing an unregulated hydrograph, what we might expect it to be. This kind of greenish line here is showing a regulated hydrograph being released from a dam. And this yellow part here that goes up and down is hydropower generation coming in from this, this bypass reach. And that's, that's pretty tricky for ecosystems, generally hydro hydropower is generated with costs, so, so there's peaking times and non-peaking times, and of course we generate hydropower during peaking times, which means for rivers, basically water kind of flows in and stops, and flows in and stops, and so there can be huge stage changes. So one of the things that's often negotiated in hydropower relicensing is this ramping and how quickly you can raise and lower um, the stage of rivers. And that's something that in alternatives, and, and we've done a lot of work on that, and I'm not putting too much of it here because it gets a little bit more on the engineering side. 
And then we're in, interested in, in stream temperatures also, and this is more for, um, for fisheries and in-stream habitat than for riparian systems. But first we just looked at without any dams, and again, this is current conditions, two, four, and six degree warming. This is showing the number of days that water temperature exceeds 21 degrees Celsius. We use 21 degrees Celsius because that's a, a stress threshold for Chinook salmon and steelhead trout, two anadromous fishes in this region. What we found is we go from the Sierra Nevada having generally pretty nice cold habitat, these are cold water rivers, to by the time we have more severe climate change, a lot of, many of the weeks out of the year have water that's too warm to, to support salmonids. And I have Yosemite highlighted here. This is a place where, of course, we manage for ecosystems and for natural resources. And the only great habitat is up in Tuolumne Meadows, which if any of you guys have been to Tuolumne Meadows, not very suitable habitat for, for, for fishes. So then this, this actually opened up um, a, a really interesting line of research to say, okay, because California has so many dams. Can we manage dams to maintain cold water for, for salmon and trout? So of course, large dams can stratify th thermally with warmer temperatures in the summer and colder temperatures or cold water pool in the bottom. So we've been doing a whole lot of work looking at, at how we can better manage temperatures to maintain downstream temperatures, and we found that we can do this, but it's limited because the, the cold water pool has a finite volume, a finite amount. We can release that water and basically extend the cold season, um, but we can't, you know, just release 200 CFS day after day out of the cold water pool. Um, absolute temperatures are still warming with, with climate change. Reservoirs can help. Stream temperatures are sensitive to the elevation dams are at, the size, the surface area. And then this is, um, we, we're, this is ongoing re research with a couple specific hydropower relicensings in the Yuba River. So then finally, we came up with a number of recommendations for managing climate, hydropower, and ecosystems, in-stream and riparian ecosystems. And first we said we you should really increase the number of alternatives you're looking at and include climate change. And in doing this, hopefully we're showing that we can model this stuff. And it's really interesting because this essentially becomes a question of, is there more uncertainty by ignoring climate change and saying in 50 years conditions will have changed, or is there more uncertainty by saying we have some models, but, but there's some uncertain elements to them. And so it's really kind of weighing two different sources of uncertainty and saying which is more. You might want to update our water year types, having year after year of critically water, dry water year types one, categorizing it doesn't matter a whole lot, and, and two, the environmental water users, users repeatedly get the short end of the stick. We should most certainly increase our monitoring. We're making these decisions that can last 50 years off of very little data. We should certainly do some more model, monitoring and have better sampling that goes into this. And then fund research on these data gaps. Um, this is, um, it's, it's tricky when, like I said, when we're looking at climate change, water regulation and ecosystems and hydropower generation, there's a whole lot of moving parts in here and we really need a lot more research on this type of work. And then with that, a finish. This is the Yuba River, so this is one of the main rivers in our study system. You can get an idea of it. And then I want to thank again, my, I have a whole lot of collaborators and co-authors on all this work. It's been going on for about four years and, and there's a whole bunch of us working on it. So with that, I can take any questions. So the question was that she said there's, <clears throat> seems like there's not a whole lot of difference between the emission scenarios, so between the A2 and the B1. And there wasn't quite as much, when, when you put this into numbers, you can see it a little bit better. And so this is visually, which I like, and especially talking to um, sometimes water managers, they like visually instead of kind of pages and pages of numbers, which I like pages and pages of numbers. Um, but so, so there was a difference, and the A2 is, is 
more severe. We've actually gotten away with this in the fifth assessment report. Now we use RCPs. And so we, we've kind of changed it. It's the same idea that we could have more severe or less severe climate change. Um, but but on our, in our newer modeling now we use RCPs, what stands for radiative climate forcings, I think. I don't see anyone shaking their head, so I'll go with that. Pathways. Pathways. We do, and yeah, and, and so some of this, again, because we're dealing with, with water managers is just trying to quantify uncertainty and be very clear where uncertainty exists and what things we know and what, what parts we don't know. Yep. There are, so the question was, is, is there dams that are mostly used for water storage or water supply and not hydropower? And there are, and I'm gonna go back here to this map. In California parlance, I've only heard this term in California, the lowest dams in mountain regions are called rim dams. And those are these big triangles, and that's where we ended our analysis. The rim dams are really large. They're things like Fol Folsom, Shasta, the dams that are like 4 million acre feet or you know, 1 million, 2 million acre feet. They're mostly used for water supply with hydropower. So for us, because we weren't as interested in water, su water supply, that was the end of our modeled extent. Yep. And all the higher, so moving up this way then, is higher elevation, and those are all hydropower reservoirs. So, so the question is, be, because this is with a relicensing, are we going to submit this alternative? Um, and we, it's, it's a little bit more academic than that, even though a state agency was interested in that and they're, they're certainly scrutinizing our alternative with a fine-tooth comb, we don't expect the licensee to give our alternative much credence because, because basically it, it manages water even tighter. So there's less water for hydropower generation and less water for ecosystems. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, the, the state agencies were really interested in it and want to show that this can be done, but it's not so much thought that it will actually be an alternative that will be choosed for this relicensing. Yeah, good question.